This is case number 97202, Arizona Lights. Something is in the sky and something is happening and I'll go to my death knowing that what I saw was true. Thousands of people all over Arizona saw something that night. I believe the Phoenix lights are real. I thought, wow, I'm just seeing things that most people are never going to see in a lifetime. March 13th, 1997. The skies above Arizona ignite. Major sighting here. Fiery globes seen by thousands. They started multiplying. One light became two lights, a third. Lights in the sky over Phoenix are nothing new. Carved into these mountain rocks, are ancient clues that the Hohokam Indians may have seen UFOs more than 1,000 years ago. Is there something about this area that attracts these objects? Pat meets Jeff Woolwine, a UFO researcher at the foot of the White Tank Mountains. These hills are riddled with petroglyphs, rock art carved into the landscape primarily by the Hohokam a Native American people who lived here from 200 BCE, 1500 CE, and then mysteriously disappeared. Clearly, the whole calm we're seeing things in the sky as we're seeing now, strange objects, strange lights, if you will. They didn't have video cameras back then. They had stone boulders to record something significant, something to remember in history. They wanted to, to copy this down so people would understand what had happened here. Pat and Jeff hiked to the spot where strange petroglyphs have been found. Among the petroglyphs is an image Jeff believes to be significant. You'll notice this interesting line here. It has a black hair, a black hair, a black hair, and a line. In today's world, what we like to call them is barbells. Barbell-shaped UFOs, like this one videotaped over Phoenix on January 24, 2005, are well known to modern researchers. It's possible that local tribespeople were inspired to record their own sightings on these very rocks nearly a millennium ago. And when you say barbell, you mean a barbell-shaped UFO? While Jeff's interpretation is a personal one, even government experts who have studied the petroglyphs for years have difficulty explaining some of the images. Have you ever wondered why schools teach so little, if anything, about the world's first advanced civilization? Especially when it introduced so many things we still use today. Why the mystery around Sumeria, which was in Mesopotamia, and what's now modern-day Iraq? After all, here are just some of what they gave us. The modern calendar based on lunar cycles, the 60-20 counting system used for geometry and measuring time, the wheel, the plow, irrigation systems like levees and canals, sailboats. They even spoke the first known language. And most importantly, they left evidence of the first recorded writing. That's a lot of intelligent contributions to humanity. So why aren't we taught more about this clearly advanced and influential civilization? Well, connect the dots and you'll discover why the omission could be deliberate. Sumerians were accurate in creating many advanced systems, yet we dismiss their history of man as mere mythology. And why is that? Well, if we gave the same credibility to their written history as we've given their inventions, we'd be teaching a completely different version of our origins. And we'd be thinking a lot more about what our future may hold. So let archaeologists continue to debate the history and evolution of man. If you go to the source, here's what the first civilization ever to record history revealed about our 
passed. In 1849, a British archaeologist discovered 14 tablets in Samaria. To date, these are the oldest known writings, and they date back to the 24th century BC. While the stories on them share much of what other ancient writings say, they put a whole new spin on the other ancient sacred texts. You see, while they do refer to a father of all beginnings, or some kind of ultimate supreme being, the tablets say that the creators in Genesis, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, these were polytheistic gods of ours, otherworldly beings, or just plain out, they were aliens. The entire first two tablets explain who they were and where they were from. Tablet 3 tells of the six days of creation, or settlement, on Earth. Later, they explain how the human race was genetically manipulated by these beings and did not evolve randomly. Even the technology Sumerians gave us came from these beings. Are you interested now in knowing more about what the Sumerians had to say about our history? Here are selected legends from the 14 tablets and their parallels with other ancient sources. According to the Sumerian tablets, 445,000 years ago, creator gods, as they call it, came to Earth. The only inhabitants of Earth were wild and undomesticated animals and early ancestors of man. These beings were called the Anunnaki, which means those who from heaven to Earth came. The Anunnaki inhabited a distant orbiting planet called Nibiru, which only entered our solar system every 3,600 years. They describe Nibiru as many times the diameter of Earth and abundant with iron oxide making its rivers and lakes appear red. Now a side note about Nibiru. According to the tablets, Nibiru's atmosphere began to deteriorate and become a hostile place for life, and in order to restore it, the Anunnaki needed one important element for their atmosphere, gold. Now here are a few interesting facts. There is proof that gold nanoparticles can be used to repair our damaged ozone. It shields radiation, which explains why NASA uses gold foils in their space stations. While NASA is currently aware of eight official planets in our solar system, there has been much speculation about the wobbly orbit of two planets, which points to the likely gravitational pull of a very large mass, which has yet to be discovered. Now detection of this mass traces back decades, but in October of 2017, NASA published an article called The Super Earth That Came Home for Dinner, stating, there are now five different lines of observational evidence pointing to the existence of Planet Nine. If you were to remove this explanation and imagine Planet Nine does not exist, then you generate more problems than you solve. Clearly, there is potential of another planet yet to be discovered in our solar system. Now, when the Anunnaki arrived, they were capable of living lives that spanned hundreds of thousands of years. They created a mining settlement they called Eridug, Earth Station One, in the Persian Gulf under a leader named Enki. The tablets convey, after a kingship descended from heaven, it was in Eridug. These visitors were not alone. They brought another extraterrestrial race with them. They were called the Ajiji, and they worked as their slaves. The Ajiji were considered inferior. They served the Anunnaki by mining gold. Civilizations grew, the Ajiji endured crushing labor, and these stories are consistent with Babylonian tablets from the 18th century BC. When the gods, manlike, bore the labor, carried the load, the gods' load was great, the toil grievous, the trouble excessive. The great Anunnaki made the Ajiji undertake 
the toil. After many centuries, the Ajiji rebelled, mistakenly believing they could overcome these oppressive masters. Their defeat almost completely annihilated their race, leaving the Anunnaki without a workforce. Unable to replace the Ajiji, Nibiru's ruler, Anu, ordered his son, Enki, to genetically engineer a new slave race, one that was intelligent enough to perform complex work, but subservient to the Anunnaki. His experiments are recounted in detail in Atrahasis. Many unique creatures were created. Enki finally successfully met his goal, and the result? A genetic hybrid between Earth's caveman, Homo erectus, and the Anunnaki themselves. This hybrid we call Homo sapiens. The tablets called first men the Adamu. In Hebrew, Adam means man. The Anunnaki put the Homo sapiens to work in the mines and elsewhere in Mesopotamia. The Semitic word avod, or worship, literally means work for. Hence, early men had no choice but to worship their gods. According to the pictographs and texts, these Anunnaki, who we know lived many centuries, were giants compared to the Homo sapiens. Now, because their main purpose in life was to serve the Anunnaki, Homo sapiens were, in return, educated with social skills and academic affairs and technology. All this is abundantly clear in the tablets. The new human slaves were sterile, but as the demand for workforce increased, they were re-engineered so that they could reproduce. This later led to an overpopulation. So later, many humans were banished from the safety of their cities, giving rise to the story of the Garden of Eden and the story of banishment from paradise for procreating. As humans evolved to become more intelligent, some Anunnaki leaders bred with these humans the children which resulted from these forbidden unions between races were called the Nephilim, or giants of old. Tablets say that these practices enraged Enlil, the Anu leader of that time, who was also the brother of Enki. Enlil wanted to ensure no human would ever rise to power and potentially rule Nibiru. Naturally, the interbreeding increased that risk, but it was beyond his control. Human populations increased over the following millennia, only to be met with a population control plan that nature had in store. During one of its 3,600 year cycles, Nibiru's orbit created havoc on the sun and on earth. Nibiru is also called the destroyer in the Colbrin, which is an ancient gospel found in Scotland that was omitted from biblical text, much like the Dead Sea Scrolls were. It reads, Men forgot the days of the destroyer, only the wise know where it went, and that it shall return at the appointed time. The destroyer, its color, bright and fierce and ever-changing, was an unstable appearance, a fierce body of flames. Though stating Nibiru usually passes without causing harm, the tablets describe one cataclysmic event which occurred when Nibiru neared Earth. It says, first, black spots appeared on the sun's surface. The Earth's magnetic field became weaker, the temperature rose, and ice caps began melting. This event we call the Deluge, or the Great Flood. It also reads, For days before the day of the deluge, the earth was rumbling, groaning, as if with pain. For nights before the calamity struck, in the heavens, Nibiru as a glowing star was seen. Well, according to the tablets, Enlil saw the oncoming disaster as an opportunity to rid the planet of humans that he deemed unworthy. He returned to Nibiru, but many Anunnaki chose to stay. Instead, 
witnessing the flooding and the destruction on the planet from their celestial boats which circled the earth. It reads, Then there was darkness in daytime, and at night the moon as though by a monster was swallowed. The earth began to shake by a force before unknown. It was agitated. In the glow of dawn, a black cloud arose from the horizon. The morning light turned to darkness. Then the sound of a rolling thunder boomed, and lightning lit the skies. On that day, on that unforgettable day, the deluge with a roar began. At that point, the South Pole's huge ice sheets collided and fell into the ocean. This would have created tsunamis everywhere, traveling north to the gold mines in Southeast Africa. The tidal wave continued north until it reached and submerged the city of Eden, one of the first Anunnaki settlements on Earth, now located somewhere at the bottom of today's Persian Gulf. Witnessing the cataclysm, Enki, who felt sympathy for his creations, instructed his chosen ones to build boats. Among these few humans was Zayasudra, we know as Noah, and his family. A great storm with heavy rains started. The tidal wave kept sweeping the earth for seven days until it finally came to a halt. But the heavy rains continued for forty more days and nights. The story of the deluge is recorded in almost every civilization on our planet. Core ice samples taken from Greenland and Antarctica illustrate that at the height of the last ice age, the sea levels were 425 feet lower than they are today. And, more importantly, there is a clear indication of a rapid sea rise. After the deluge, Reconstruction of a new spaceport began. The text describes how the Anunnaki made their buildings according to the position of the stars. It reads, Let the heart of the plain, the heavens, reflect. Once Enki to this agreed, and Leal from the skies of distances took measures. Indeed, the pyramids, now questioned to be much older than originally determined, and many other ancient monuments are, in fact, aligned to the stars. When the Anunnaki finally left Earth, their influence had reached every corner of the world, from Mesopotamia to India to South America. Before they left, they gifted humanity the Sumerian civilization, which was inexplicably advanced for its time, having made a sort of a sudden appearance as a mature and highly organized culture that came out of nowhere. The Anunnaki taught the Sumerians their way of life and established monarchs. Now here's where it gets interesting. The kings would act as their emissaries on earth and rule the people according to ancient principles. Unbeknownst to man, royal bloodlines were genetically manipulated by the Anunnaki. This would in turn explain the strong aversion by nobility to interclass breeding. Some people speculate that the Anunnaki have deceptively managed to control the earth through this selective breeding of nobility for centuries, millennia. Others speculate that as the tablets indicate, Nibiru may once again come close to our planet, and then the Anunnaki will return and restore rule over the slave race they created. This would explain the secrecy around the Sumerian recorded history. Either way, 3,600 years approaches a new cycle. So now that you know what ancients reveal about our origins, perhaps you'd like to decide.